Our scripture lesson is from Isaiah, Isaiah 55. And it is important to know the audience, the original audience for this is, uh, was the Hebrew people who were in uh, Babylon. They had been uh, captured. Jerusalem had been sacked, the temple destroyed, and they were taken off into slavery. And so Isaiah, Isaiah who has lamented, Isaiah who has uh, communicated God's judgment is now uh, conveying a promise. I uh, saw one person called this the great invitation. Uh, we often talk about the greatest commandment, the great commission. Listen to this great invitation. Ho, oh, everyone who is thirsty, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that is not bread? Why do you labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There are so, uh, the, that passage is full of invitations. Come to me, all you are thirsty. Who? All who are thirsty. Incline your ear. Listen carefully. Come, you who have no money. Jesus, and we're in this passage, the Lord through Isaiah has flung the doors open to the Hebrew people to give up uh, what they have been fed by Babylon, by that empire, to give up that royal food that does not satisfy, to give up what they have been fed by an empire that has taught them that they are lesser than, an empire that calls them to worship other gods, an empire that says, your God does not exist. Are they satisfied with that? Are they spiritually weak, spiritually dead inside by that royal food that makes them think royal thoughts? I think so. I think so. And so Isaiah says, uh, to listen carefully uh, and eat and delight in what is good so that what? So that you may live. Not just so that your life will be better. Not uh, just so you would be uh, more satisfied, uh, less um, hungry for uh, hope. Instead, uh, that you will live. What are you thirsty for? You know, and, and that passage is specifically uh, about a people enslaved, specifically about a promise of um, liberation, a second exodus. Uh, the chapter ends with, uh, you shall go out with joy and led forth with peace. You shall go out with joy, out from Babylon with joy and led back to Jerusalem, shalom with peace. That's what they hungered and thirsted for. For what Jerusalem represented for them. 
What do you hunger for? Where is your heart aching? Since March, things have been radically different for all of us. And it has affected people in different ways. When I asked uh, some of the people or asked the people in the Bible study uh, with a hunger and thirst for, uh, one person said, for, uh, not to be afraid anymore to go out, to, to not have that, that fear uh, that that just seem that's just looming, that fear that has robbed us of so much, that the fear that makes us anxious about even the smallest of things. And another said, uh, socialization, community, true community, and uh, while we have this online community being uh, with each other, being in the presence of each other, uh, nourishes us, strengthens us for the week. Us just gathering on Sundays, or when you gather to knit in the circle, or for Presbyterian women, or Shalom sisters, or for B team, uh, it strengthens you, right? Another said, kindness she said she thirsts for kindness of course or i would i would say that we have the most control over that that we have no reason uh for that not to be satisfied. Uh, a pandemic that has now lasted uh, for us six months uh, will wear you down, has worn us down. And uh, lately, lately it has been uh, especially challenging over the last month or so, I don't know when the turning point was uh, for you, or maybe you're not there. Um, but uh, over the last month, uh, the the it's hard to see uh, an end. It feels like there's no end in sight. Uh, Rob Bell says that despair is. Uh, believing that tomorrow will never be different than today. Is that where you are? Surely, if you are, that's not a very satisfying feeling. Rather, that an emptiness comes from that. Uh, it deadens our hearts, deadens our soul. If this is it, this is it. Uh, during the Vietnam War, thousands of U.S. soldiers were captured and were prisoners of war uh, until many years after even the war was ended. Uh, of those thousands, 591 returned. Uh, one was a commander, uh, Commander Stockdale, who was there uh, for seven years under captivity, and he was asked who didn't make it? And he said, to our surprise, the optimist. Who didn't make it? The optimists, the ones who said, we'll, we'll be free by Christmas. And then Christmas would come and go and they would say, we'll be free by Easter. And then in time for the 4th of July, and then again by Christmas, and comes and it goes. Stockdale says he believes that they eventually died of a broken heart. 
Now, there's, uh, there's just no uh, great way of describing the difference between an optimist and someone who uh, holds on to hope. Because surely people who hope are optimistic. And so uh, it, that illustration only makes sense if we remember this part of what Stockdale conveyed. That the people who made it did believe they would be set free. That that was uh, the uh, point of departure, that that had to be uh, what sustained them, that they would be set free, that their status, their situation was provisional, that being a prisoner was the penultimate existence, but that ultimately they would be set free. It's a little different. It's a little different because it required them to live in their situation, to, uh, to commit their minds, not to just holding on by fingertips, but instead uh, to recognize that this is, uh, for now, the reality. And I think it's where we are. Uh, rather than, well, hopefully by September or Thanksgiving. Instead, this is where we are now. This is what church looks like now. And it's hard. It's hard and I think it's getting harder. So how can we, uh, what, what do we need to move towards? Because God will satisfy, right? If God promises the thirsty who are in captivity, who are enslaved, uh, that what he brings will satisfy, will give you life, incline your ear to me, take delight in this food that is good, well, surely that promise holds true for us too. He says that he will make an everlasting covenant with his people. Our relationship is secure. Just as it was secure before the pandemic, it is now our relationship with God, that we are God's children, has a uh, tenacious, it's a tenacious love, Hesed, a tenacious love that will not let go. There uh, was a church worker um, who uh, went to Latin America to work in refugee camps. Uh, and uh, this story is from, uh, I got the story from Living Into Community uh, by Christine Pohl. Uh, and uh, the person who told the story, her name was Joyce Holliday. Uh, she said, as soon as the refugees got to a new camp, they did three things. They set up three committees. A committee on construction or of construction. We're going to need latrines. We're going to need places for just people to sleep. And then uh, preparing for the future, recognizing that uh, they needed to continue to live uh, as if this camp was where they were going to be, um, that, this, uh, that they had to uh, live fully or, uh, uh, and raise their children in the camp just as they would if they were in the village. And so the second committee was a committee on education. But the third committee is what surprised her the most, a committee on joy. Refugee camps, committee of construction, committee of education, and a committee on joy. That joy was just as important as latrines. Joy was just as important as teaching their children. One of the refugees said to Joyce, 
Uh, you don't take our, our suffering seriously. You work like someone who will only be here for a year and then return to North America. He was trying to get her to embrace the joy, even in the camp, to believe that, uh, and that while this situation they were in was horrible, it was not the last word, but it was the reality. And so they were not going to shortchange uh, themselves of the joy. Wrapping up. So what are our committees? What are the committees you have created for yourself in this pandemic? What is essential? for you so that you might live, that you might continue to have abundant life because you can have abundant life now too, right? If God is sovereign, if in the end, what really matters is that you're a child of God and that you belong to the body of Christ, you can have joy now. I was talking to brother Jim Ford uh, earlier this week and uh, with uh, some slimity, but also with, uh, in wisdom, he says, I think we need to work on gratitude. Gratitude is uh, the memory of the heart. The memory of the heart. Gratitude can sustain you. I've watched it, sustain, watched it sustain people in, in grief, in suffering, in illness, in strife, in conflict. Gratitude. And so Isaiah's word, Isaiah's word is not about them leaving tomorrow. Rather, it is inviting them the people enslaved, inviting them to re-embrace this uh, covenant that will be sealed on their heart, as it says in Jeremiah 31, to uh, remember that this reality is provisional and that God is sovereign. That God's word will not return to him empty which it says later in Isaiah 55, just says the rain comes and that it bears fruit from the ground. So too God's word will not return to God empty and that God will accomplish God's purposes. Isaiah 55. Hold fast to the promises of our Lord so that you may live. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.